morning, we will discuss update in dialysis related amyloidosis. We all know that dialysis related amyloidosis is due to deposition of beta 2 microglobulin. Now we will discuss the pathogenesis as well as the management, which includes the preventive action. So the agenda will be beta 2 microglobulin and the pathogenesis of dialysis related amyloidosis. It's a clinical presentation, risk of mortality, and strategy for prevention and the treatment. Beta-2 microglobulin is a low molecular weight polypeptide, which is 11,800 dalton, which is present on the surface of all nucleated cells, expressing the major histocompatibility class. Beta-2 microglobulin production rate is constant at a level between 2 and 4 mg per kg daily. And in normal subjects, the plasma concentration varies from 1 to 3, with a half-life of 3 hours, while in dialysis patient, it may reach 30 microgram per milli due to accumulation of beta-2 microglobulin. Beta-2 is eliminated by glomerular filtration and subsequent reabsorption and catabolism by proximal tubules. Beta-2 microglobulin discovered very early in 1964 in the urine of subjects with Wilson disease or cadmium poisoning. It is 100 amino acid protein of relatively small molecular weight. 11,000 Dalton, and it's encoded by gene in chromosome 15 in humans. Beta-2 microglobulin is continuously degenerated by all nucleated cells of the body. The level of beta-2 microglobulin thought to reflect the release of molecules that are non-conveniently bound to MHC1 into the circulation and once it's freely filtered by the glomerulus. The physiologic conditions produced at a constant rate between two and four, pathological conditions like inflammatory, hematological, immunodeficiency, and renal diseases, plasma beta-2 microglobins are extremely elevated. Beta-2 microglobulin retention in CKD almost to a zero GFR, then transform into amyloid deposits and invade synovian membranes and osteoarticular sites. So it's called, and that is dialysis-related amyloidosis. So this is a retention phase early in CKD and in all hemodialysis patients changing the character, transformations, including glycations, then invasion. And it has very high affinity to articular cartilage. So the dialysis-related amyloidosis is directly linked to the beta-2 microglobulin with insignificant adhesion to organs like GIT. So it's mainly related to synovial membranes and the osteoarticular sites. We will see why for these locations. The conditions under which one would expect a higher number of cells peering MHC class molecule to be generated or conditions in which higher shedding of beta-2 microglobin is observed. So high beta-2 microglobulin in myeloma, chronic lymphatic leukemia, systemic lupus, erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, Jogren syndrome, and Crohn's disease, where inflammatory or neoplastic lesion can generate beta-2 microglobulin. It's very common in myeloma, and one of the therapeutic challenge in follow-up patients with myeloma is to measure the beta-2 microglobulin, even if there is no renal impairment. Rule of dialysis in the amyloidogenesis, we have retention from 
dietic secretion by the kidneys that followed by longer duration of hemodialysis, overproduction and inflammation from hemodialysis itself, like impurities in water or bioincompatible dialyzer and membranes. In the past, it's a kiprofen can induce a lot of production of beta 2 microglobulin due to inflammation. So dialysis impurities, type of dialyzers, elevated levels of cytokines, all play the, the dialysis-related amyloidosis pathogenesis. While advanced granulation in the products can share in the deposition criteria, Beta 2 microglobulin amyloidosis patients, most of the clinical symptoms are not always directly linked to amyloid deposition itself, but rather to associated inflammatory reactions. So the patients usually have pain and disabilities, not only from the deposition criteria, but the inflammatory reactions around the deposition. So we have beta 2 microglobulin amyloidosis accumulations, could be early in cervical disc, because there is increase of chondroitin sulfate protoglycans affinity, and accumulation in the vascular role and synovium due to affinity to heparin sulfate protoglycans. As well, there is interaction between negative charges of sulfate groups of protoglycans and positive charges of basic amino acids in the endoterminal side of beta 2 microglobin. This is the affinity of beta 2 microglobin for deposition and specifically for the articular cartridge due to its affinity for the chondroitin sulfate protoglycans and the heparin sulfate protoglycans. Once it deposited, there is a lot of interaction between the negative charge of sulfate groups of protoglycans and the positive charges of basic amino acids of beta 2 microglobin. Associated increase in advanced glycation in the product in synovium, increased cytokine production in synoviums, increased expression of matrix metalloproteinases and destructive changes as a final. <coughs> Elevated levels of cytokines from hemodialysis procedure, inflammation, retention of cytokines, stimulate the synthesis and the release of beta 2 microglobulin by macrophages, augmented the expression of HLA class 1 angine. So there is retention from bad excretion, as well increased synthesis from inflammation, while inflammation itself can increase the production and increase the deposition as well. So inflammation induces the production, increase the deposition, and increase the pain in the patients. Advanced glycation in the product modified beta 2 microglobulin accumulates as well, especially in diabetic patients. Beta 2 microglobulin advanced glycation in the products leads to inflammatory response and the recruitment of inflammatory cells, principally monocytes and macrophage, around the amyloid deposits. So, usually, beta 2 microglobulin molecules as well additional advanced glycation in the products molecules participates in the pathogenesis of the disease. This diagram shows that how is the inflammatory reactions of the blood membrane interaction can induce reactive oxygen species as well advanced glycation in the products the position with the support of cytokines, they can induce osteoclast activations during bone resorption, 
osteoplast inhibition decrease bone formations. All of that as discussed early in the bones and synovium. That's uremia related retention from bad excretion through the glomerulus or hemodialysis induced through bio incompatibility and inflammation during hemodialysis sessions. Note that player here is advanced glycation in the protein beta 2 microglobulin, stimulant is inflammatory reactive oxygen species, as well as cytokines and chemokines. Osteoclast activation and osteoplast inhibition. The distribution of beta 2 microglobulin in the patients has a bicompartmental kinetics, meaning that interdialytic and the intradialytic. The interdialytic parameters is the accumulation phase of beta-2 microglobulin, and the intradialytic is the removal rate of beta-2 microglobulin from the blood, while the shift of beta-2 microglobulin from the blood to the membrane there is very slow release of beta-2 microglobulin from tissue to the blood. So that's called kinetics. As an example, the urea kinetics is very easy one because it's diffusible from the tissue to the blood, very easy, while others like beta-2 microglobulin, phosphate, and the middle molecules, the diffusion rate is very slow and so beta-2 microglobulin has a bicompartment kinetics. The bicompartmental kinetics, which is a perfusing compartment that removed from the blood through the dialyzers, and depend on two main factors, the clearance of beta-2 microglobulin criteria of the dialysis membrane, high flux and superflux, and the KUF. So the KUF, once increase the ultrafiltration rate of the dialysis, like in HDF, you remove much more of beta-2 microglobulin. So dialyzer clearance and the ultrafiltration rate, both of them increase the removal of beta-2 microglobulin. While the non-perfusing compartment in the tissue is very slow. So beta-2 opaque bicompartmental kinetics inter and intradialytic compartments, dialyzer clearance and the ultrafiltration rate increase the removal. Low flux, high flux, HDF. The most important is the HDF because it removes much more as it increases the ultrafiltration. So patients on substitution 20 liters and above has higher clearance of beta-2 microglobin from dialysis, while dialyzers with more beta-2 microglobin clearance in superflux can remove as well too much of beta-2 microglobin. And this is a graph showing that beta-2 microglobin renal clearance drop very early in CKD And if the patient has a residual re renal function, there's some excretion of beta-2 microglobulin from the blood. Beta-2 microglobulin, abnormality in structure, advanced glycation in the product co-function, local deposition, whenever there is abnormal microenvironment of inflammatory inflammation, such inflammation can make modifications of proteins by inflammatory cells, co-depositions, mainly with advanced glycation in the products. So this is a final scenario of beta-2 microglobulin-related dialysis-related amyloidosis. We have retention of beta-2 microglobulin with abnormality of structure, 
and the high affinity to synovial membranes precipitated by locally inflamed giants by inflammatory mediators with a co-deposition of advanced glycation in the product. This is the three steps for the patient to develop dialysis-related amyloidosis and explain largely why not all patients have dialysis-related amyloidosis, although it seems the same level of beta-2 microglobulin in between. Because such patients with more inflammation will have more deposition. And it has thus a double meaning. If you found your patient has dialysis-related amyloidosis, make sure that he will have additional inflammation in his body. The carpal tunnel syndrome, it's a famous presentation, depends on the duration of hemodialysis from retention as well as from inflammation. Whenever the age, the female, beta-2 microglobulin levels, and the low flux dialysis, all these four variables increase the deposition. So carpal tunnel syndrome is one of the clinical presentation of dialysis-related amyloidosis. Risk factors promoting for dialysis-related amyloidosis, long-term dialysis treatment, age of onset of hemodialysis treatment, loss of residual renal function, and the type of dialysis membrane, low flux against high flux, biocompatible against bioincompatible. Intervention is mainly preventive action. You should do dialysis with high quality before going to high flux membrane. Avoid excessive intradialytic ultrafiltration and use of high flux biocompatible membrane and ultra pure dialysate modify the disease. Factors inducing inflammation in CKD, like uremic toxins, reduced clearance of pro inflammatory cytokines, acute and chronic infections impaired intestinal barriers, endotoxin translocation, oxidative stress, light chain disease, accumulation, amyloid, A proteins overload, systemic dysfunction, mineral and bone disorders, asymmetric dimethyl arginine, hyperhomocysteinemia, advanced glycation in the products, as well as comorbidities. All these are factors induce inflammation in patients on dialysis and predispose the already accumulated beta-2 microglobin to be deposited in the synovium. Again, why not all patients with the same level of beta-2 microglobin has no dialysis-related amyloidosis? Patients with inflammation is more prone for dialysis-related amyloidosis. Dialysis-related amyloidosis, as much as 20% of patients after two to four years of dialysis, and 100% of patients after 13 years of hemodialysis. The complex issue from retention to the positions, retention in end-stage renal disease, excess production during hemodialysis from impurities of dialysate and inflammation, glycations, deposition, and invasion. This is the four steps of dialysis-related amyloidosis complexity issue. The affinity to osteoarticular system, bone, synovium, muscle, tendons, ligaments, bone cyst, scapula, periarthritis, joint arthropathy, and destructive spondyloarthropathy. So there is the retention and or 
excess production from inflammation during dialysis. Patient with chronic inflammation, co deposition with glycation in the products and metabolic change of the PETA2 microglobulin, then deposition and invasion of the osteoarticular system. Why PETA2 microglobulin deposition is mainly articular? As we discussed, the deposition in bone and ligament is part explained by the affinity of PETA2 microglobulin for type 1 and type 2 collagen. In the serum of uremic patient, but not in healthy subjects, the presence of intermediate misfolded forms of PETA2 microglobulin as well. That's the metabolic criteria of the native PETA2 microglobulin and its glycation as well. So modified PETA2 microglobulin shows an affinity for collagen up to tenfold higher than native PETA2 microglobulin. One part is retention, the second part is modification, and these modifications make a tenfold higher affinity to osteoarticular cartilage. So dialysis rate amyloidosis has a double meaning. One is retention, second is inflammation. Retention of beta-2 microglobulin, modification by advanced glycation in the product, binding with pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor, transforming growth factors, co-deposition with advanced glycation in the product, as well glycation of the P native beta-2 microglobulin. So the analysis rate amyloidosis active osteoclastic pole resorption, synovial tissue or intervertebral disc, inflammatory cells infiltrating the synovial tissue, inflammatory cytokines induce receptor activation of nuclear factor kappa, promote inflammatory osteolysis. This is the typical scenario how the retention molecule of beta-2 microglobulin can induce dialysis related amyloidosis and osteoarthropathy. Clinical findings mainly carpal tunnel syndrome, trigger finger, destructive spondyloarthropathy, destructive arthropathy, bone cyst, pathologic fracture. Very rarely on the visible, like ischemic gastrites or enterites ischemic heart disease, rupture of the spleen, and subcutaneous amyloidoma, but mainly it is bone and cartridge. Some of the X-ray findings and MRI for different pattern of dialysis related amyloidosis. There is aggressive osteolytic lesion in the femoral neck. And this is the classic amyloid cyst through the carpus and distal radius, which is a typical location of dialysis related amyloidosis bone cyst. These are radiolations, lesions of various size involving carpal bones. And this is the guitar string sign, like playing a guitar. Hand of a player of a guitar. This is a characteristic guitar string sign. Due to the shrunken flexor tendons. Ultrasound also could be of value showing thickening of flexor tendon and amyloid tissue in synovial tissue, adjacent to tendons.
and MRI finding, which is more obvious than in conventional radiograph with large intra-articular and periarticular hypotetic amyloid deposits. This hypointense amyloid deposit is clearly found in MRI pictures. This is showing the MR image, market thickening of the flexors tendon, and can induce, as we discussed past the slides, the guitar string sign of amyloidosis deposition. This is the in increase of the carpal bone with amyloid tissue, multiple erosions are very obvious. An MR image, osteolysis in superior posterior humeral head. Also, the spine could be affected with spondyloarthropathy. And on the thoracic spine, marked destruction of the disc space with multiple erosions and the reactive sclerosis. Again, hypointense amyloid tissue at site of synovial and the ligamentous structure of the right facet joints of T12. Back to the agenda, the risk of mortality, it is associated higher level of beta-2 microglobin with the risk of mortality. High level of serum beta-2 microglobin predicts severity of coronary artery disease. And the plasma beta-2 microglobin as a function of chronic kidney disease they start very early. Once the patient reach CKD stage 5, the risk is high due to loss of the excretion. And the beta-2 microglobin is a significant predictor of mortality in maintenance hemodialysis patients. With the level below 20, the survival is improvement. And the level above 30, the relative risk of death increase. So we can check our patients with the pre-dialysis beta-2 microglobin level. If it's below 20, it's a good marker. Beta-2 microglobin level is a significant predictor of mortality in maintenance hemodialysis patients. Glycation of beta-2 microglobin stimulates the secretion of multiple pro-inflammatory cytokines from macrophage, and this explains why patients with dialysis-related amyloidosis who has as well inflammation has a higher level of death. What is the strategy for prevention and the treatment of diarrhea-related amyloidosis? It's mainly preventive. Hemodiarrhea to remove uremic toxins beyond the beta-2 microglobin as well, because beta-2 microglobin is 11,000, but in addition, there is at least 27 middle molecules bigger than beta-2 microglobin. But it's considered as a godfather of the middle molecules.
this complicated diagram showing how there is cytokines, adipokines, advanced glycation in the products can induce atherosclerosis in patients on dialysis. So middle molecules beyond the beta-2 microglobulin, like cytokines, are essentially to be prevented from production as well, enhance their secretion by the dialysis membrane. Management of dialysis-related amyloidosis, decreased production by decreasing the inflammation during dialysis sessions, increased removal by using high flux membranes or hemodial filtration, inhibit the, all the inflammation and treat the patient's inflammation conditions like infections and others, remove the cytokines by hemodial filtration, improve the environmental factors, so prevention rather than therapeutic is the main approach. Can use a super flux membrane and medium cut of membranes to remove much more of the cytokines. The player which increase the deposition of beta-2 microglobulin and targeting beyond the two beta-2 microglobulin in molecular weight is essential. As we discussed earlier in this talk, beta-2 microglobulin as a retention molecule needs glycation, need inflammation, and need environmental factor to be deposited in the patients. In creating the dialysis membrane and the dialysis convection therapy in hemodial filtration improve the removal of beta-2 microglobulin. Increasing the flux, increasing the rate of removal not only for the beta-2 microglobulin but the cytokines produced in the body to prevent the beta-2 microglobulin amyloidosis. So higher convection volume is associated with higher removal of beta-2 microglobulin. This explains why hemodial filtration is better than high flux in removal rate of beta-2 microglobulin. Please remember that beta-2 microglobulin is 11,800, while the albumin is around 66,000. Urea is very small, it's only 60 delta. The Japanese classification, and I like this classification because they classify the dialyzer membranes according to beta-2 microglobin clearance. Class 4 and 5, which have highest level of clearance of beta-2 microglobin, and the worldwide classification of high flux membrane depending on the beta-2 microglobin sieving coefficient above 0.6. Remember also, ultra-pure dialysate is important in preventing inflammation during dialysis. So using high flux membrane in addition of ultra-pure dialysate prevent the cytokine production and prevent the dialysis-related amyloidosis. Water treatment, chemical, microbial, do frequent disinfection, Choose the right way and the right method of these infections. Good monitoring. All of them prevent the development of the related amyloidosis. Endotoxin level should be below 0.03 EU per milli. Use endotoxin filters, one or two, to remove endotoxin from the dialysis. A lot of clinical outcome publications of effect of ultra pure dialysis on markers of inflammation. Decrease in C reactive proteins, decrease in other inflammatory and oxidative markers, 
significant increase in serum albumin decrease in the weekly erythropoietin dose. In high flux, there is back filtration. So patient is injected with six to eight liters of dialysate during a single session of hemodialysis with high flux. So it's important to protect that from impurities and endotoxin level. Optimized by HDF using endotoxin retention filters, increase the removal of beta 2 microglobin, use ultra pure for high flux dialysis, and use sterile for hemodial filtration. If you are using only one filter, you can have ultra pure dialysis. But if you have in serial two endotoxin filter, you have a, a substitution fluid which is sterile. That's the difference between high flux dialysis using one filter and hemodial filtration using at least two filters. Increasing the dose of hemodial filtration by substitution above 20 liters improve dialysis related amyloidosis. So prevention and the treatment, since there is no etiological, medical, or pharmacological cure for dialysis-related amyloidosis, removal of plasma beta-2 microglobin through that. So dialysis session remains a cornerstone of prevention and the treatment. In fact, in the last few years, wider use of high pipe compatible high flux membrane for dialysis treatment has decreased the incidence of dialysis-related amyloidosis worldwide. After renal transplantation, beta-2 microglobin markedly improved after renal transplantation with exception of tenocyanophytes of the flexor tendons, which may persist during the, the long-term follow-up, while clinical symptoms tended to disappear, bone cyst, and the histological deposition persisted in the long-term follow-up after renal transplantation. Thank you very much.